Hey, Dr. Bob here. All right, I apologize uh, as usual for lack of technical ability and uh, kind of these presentations. It's gonna be a long one. Um, I think it's an important topic. I'm directing this at Alaskans. Um, I've gotta do some background uh, because I, I, I need to create a conviction that I'm not overly biased or don't have a decent frame of reference. Um, I think I'm going for my first dislikes, but it's been a good run so far. There's going to be some people whose toes are stepped on. I'm going to be stepping on my own. Um, as you see, outline for today's Alaska at Extreme Risk talk. I want people to understand just what extreme risk we are at here in Alaska. Right now, we look great, but I worry about the future. I got to start with some background. Um, so I went to med school, University of Texas Southwestern in 1986 to 1990. The summer before I went to med school, I was gifted with the opportunity to come up and fish in Cook Inlet on a drift boat commercially. I made $8,000 in 1986. That was pretty good money. That was my money to go start medical school. Um, that summer in 1986, before I started medical school, it was the greatest experience of my life. I knew I was gonna live in Alaska the rest of my life. I just loved the experience. The commercial fishing experience was awesome. Everything about it was great. 1987, that summer, I came up and I worked in a cannery, Salamatoff Cannery on the Kenai Peninsula. Another wonderful experience. I was a dock hand. I had 20 hour days and they'd tell me to go sleep for four hours. We slept in trailers and co-mingled with all the other cannery workers. It was awesome. Another great set of memories. Boy, I, I, you know, I hate to begrudge another young person the opportunity to come up and have that sort of experience. Um, I finished med school, did pretty well. As you guys, anybody that's followed my vlogs or blogs knows, I, I understand medicine pretty well. I've been an ER doc for 27 years, seen something like 60,000 patients, haven't talked to a lawyer. Um, you know, graduated from a great medical school, can't say enough about UT Southwestern, and uh, had an awesome residency in emergency medicine, practiced emergency medicine for almost 25 years on the Kenai Peninsula, and now I'm scattered around a bit. I've been practicing in Montana, um, the whole deal. So anyways, that's my background as far as medical training. Now, I got a term up there called bubba biology because there's going to be some of that always with me, and there's going to be some of that in this talk. Um, bubble biology. Okay, I'm going to give you an example. I remember as an ER physician, recently there's been this big drive for what's called surviving sepsis campaign. Now, surviving sepsis is, uh, sepsis is when bacterial infection overwhelms your body and you basically die from multi-system organ failure. That's a quick assessment. And some years ago, it turned out that they realized that the best course of treatment was really aggressive fluid therapy. And how they did this was they, had, they did a procedure where they had put Swan's Gans catheters in people, which are these large bore catheters that they either put in the internal jugular vein or the subclavian vein and put the tip of the catheter into the right side of your heart and they can measure your volume status. It's a very accurate way to measure how much volume people are getting so you can adjust fluid balances. And it turned out people needed way more fluid than what we were giving them from this study. And it changed the way sepsis was managed. But when the study came out, it became a standard of care, okay, to put these catheters in people if they were septic, which is a pretty common diagnosis. And I told my ED director, at that time, I had given up the directorship here at Central Peninsula Hospital, and one of my colleagues was doing it. There was no way I was doing that because academic medicine does a lot of stupid stuff, okay? First off, there's a potential for bias because academic medicine is largely run by pharmaceutical or other industries that have a dog in the fight of the outcome of the science because then their stuff gets used, okay? Like, and I'm not saying this happened with this particular thing, but it, it's an underlying concern. 
the Swans Gan catheter company, the companies that check the labs they say we got to check. So let's just say they created this elaborate protocol where you have to put these catheters in people, monitor their fluid status, and give them a ton of fluid. I read the studies and I said, man, I haven't been giving people with sepsis enough fluid. I need to give more fluid. That's what I'm going to do. I told my director I wasn't putting Swans Gan's catheters in people if they had sepsis. They could do it in the ICU if they wanted after I admitted them. I got the message, I'm going to give more fluids, okay? Six months later, the study came out. Guess what? They did a randomized study to determine if getting a Swans Gan catheter to treat the sepsis versus just giving a lot of fluid, who had the better outcomes? Who do you think? The fluid only group. Why? Because when you poke holes in people with sharp sticks, you hurt things. Of course they're going to have a worse outcome. It was the ludicrous thing I'd ever heard, and Bubba Biology told me that. Another quick example of Bubba Biology. Med school, fourth year, surgery internship. I'm in the Ho Parkland Hospital Surgery ER. One of the other fourth year med students, I'm getting to do my first laceration. No, I'm getting to watch a Residents sew up the first laceration. Some guy fell in the dirt. He's got dirt in this nasty facial wound, right? It's grimy. It, I mean, it's just totally, you know, not sterile. So the whole kit's out there, you know, to sew them up, right? The little drapes and everything, and the, and the, and the surgery resident's got his gloves on. And I went to point to the wound, and the other fourth-year medical student goes, Oh, you broke a sterile field! And I'm thinking to myself, sterile field? The wound couldn't be any dirtier if there was a dog turd in it. You know, and guess what? Now, I always wore sterile gloves when I sewed because I felt like it was kind of, you know, people would look at you weird if you didn't. Those are expensive. You've got to strip the package open. They're sized perfectly. A study came out 10 years ago that confirmed my fourth year Bubba biology, okay, that you don't need to wear sterile gloves for sewing up non-sterile wounds. The study actually looked at the infection rate in wounds when they were sewn with sterile gloves versus just the little old box gloves that you see us grabbing out of all the time, usually purple, right? And it didn't meet statistical significance, but the infection rate was lower in the box gloves, and that was just lucky. There really should be no difference in infection rate. You're, it's not a sterile procedure. Somebody's cutting your appendix out, or doing brain surgery, different story. All right, that's enough about bubble biology for now. You'll hear about it tomorrow when I talk about tomorrow, you think you have COVID-19, what should you do now? That'll be a good one for everybody. This next talk is directed at Alaskans. All right, what do I have at risk? Well, with this COVID-19, um, you know, all Alaska Outdoors is at risk. That's my beautiful beaver. I own that personally, and I have partners in the lodge. I don't know if I'll even put that beaver on insurance this year. If I don't put it on insurance, I ain't flying it. I can't afford to, okay? So, we've got a fishing lodge, okay? And obviously, right now, you got a 14-day quarantine. Nobody's coming into the state to go fishing, and if that continues, um, which I think it should for quite some time, as you're going to see from the talk, it's going to have a negative impact on that business. All right, so that's one thing I have at stake. What else do I have at stake? Hey, I'm on the front lines, okay? So um, you guys, if you've watched any of my other videos, you know I'm not real worried about if I personally get the virus that I'm going to have a bad outcome. I know what this virus does. It attacks the unhealthy. That is not me. There may be some weird genetic predispositions, but I bet I don't have them. I have really good blood pressure. I think high blood pressure, some of the genetics that lead to that may be part of the genetics that causes a bad outcome because there sure seems to be a correlation. High blood pressure is the most common comorbidity in people that do poorly. All right, I'm on the front lines. If this thing goes sideways, I'm going to be seeing a lot of COVID. So I've got that at risk. Now, if it doesn't go sideways, ER volumes are down. I may work less. So I might be working a lot less or a lot more, but it'll be horrible conditions. I'll be watching death. I'm sure everybody's got the news on. It's a mess when there's a bunch of this going on at once. So what do we know about the coronavirus? 
Well, it's highly infective and highly transmissible, meaning you can give it to somebody very easily. It's in the air if you've got it, you're breathing it out. If you sneeze and it gets on stuff, it hangs around for a long time. Hand hygiene, masks all make sense. I knew masks right from the get-go. We know that quarantine and social distancing works. Alaska is a prime example. We barely have it. Alaska's current condition. What do we know now? Okay. Well, we're going to go to that. Here we go. I downloaded this off the state website yesterday. Um, you can go to this. It updates you. It's well done. It's a uh, COVID-19. Um, but here's the, here's the money page. Okay. The new cases that were diagnosed yesterday the, uh, would be the day before yesterday now because I downloaded this yesterday, 13. The total cases, 226. The recovered, 32 statewide. Total hospitalizations, 27 and 7 deaths. So we're not very uh, if impacted by this right now. Good thing because we have a, no, a very small medical system here. Um, you can follow down and you can go to some other data and that's what this is right here. Now they used to present this in a lot nicer thing where you could see the whole table, but I'm going to take you, imagine this is a big giant table that goes way up and uh, higher and way up to the left and across this board. And what this is, is total cases tested in Alaska yesterday, as of yesterday to generate the 226 positives, I think it was. I did the math, we have a 0.3% chance if you get tested that you're positive, okay? So who are we testing? Well, we're testing according to the guidelines, okay? Um, let me see if I can make this bigger. Uh, let's see, view, um, ah, not good enough. All right, I'll read you what it says. The, here's, the, here's the key components of this testing. Okay, we're testing the high people for sure. Those are those that are hospitalized and you think they have COVID. Okay, which, okay, so you have fever, cough, shortness of breath, and at least one of the following underlying should be available if you get tested. So what I'm trying to point out is we're testing people where there should be a high index of suspicion. So if you're hospitalized, you're gonna get tested. Um, if you, um, I can read it better here, sorry. If you live in a long-term care facility, you're gonna get tested. If you're a healthcare worker or first responder, you're gonna get tested. If you have a known close contact to COVID-19, you're gonna get tested. If you've traveled in the past 14 days, to a location where community transmission of COVID-19 is occurring, so a high-risk location, like the one we're going to discuss here in a minute, New York, you're going to get tested. You're considered medium risk if you are an outpatient who is at increased risk for serious disease. So age greater than 60, all the comorbidities, obesity, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, immunosuppression, chronic lung disease, okay? You're not healthy. Probably going to have a higher incidence of testing those people to get ahead of it. Um, also, medium, oh, and, and then any other is low, any other patient as determined by clinical discretion. So that allows us doctors to still test low-risk patients, all right? And then do not test asymptomatic persons. So those 7,000 tests have been done on mostly people probably in high risk, some in the medium risk, and probably occasional low risk. And there's only 0.3% of them coming back positive. That's good news. It's not really here yet, and we're social distancing, and we can snuff it out. But boy, is it in other places. You ready for this? New York City. Okay? Let me explain this to you. If you're dark purple, this county, okay, you have a 62 to 78% chance of that test being positive under those same criteria. And the lighter colors are only 24 to 48% chance. So here's the deal. If you're in an area where this is 
wide open, you probably got it if you have symptoms, okay? And those numbers were generated through 127,000 people tested by April 7th, all right? Now, my concern is when people from places like this come to Alaska, and there are little microcosms of this scattered all over, all right, you get it? Back to the outline. All right, so what else do we know? We got Alaska's current condition, we got elsewhere. There's a lot of it outside. It kills, especially the sick and the compromised. All right, we all get that. Now, I'm gonna go into some Bubba epidemiology, okay? We know that it's starting to decline in Italy, Spain, and the initial data right now looks like in New York. Now, watch them. If they start to lessen social distancing and business closures and start to try to resume business as usual and we start to see a resurgence, we do not need anybody coming up here. I don't think we should be making decisions about relaxing influx into this state from potential areas where there's a lot of disease for quite some time. Until we clearly see places where it's already ripped through it and they're relaxing the social distancing and we're not seeing a resurgence. Opinion. Bubba epidemiology opinion. Make sense? All right. Now, I'm going to go to the Alaska at-risk map. This is real simple. This is just a map of our beautiful state, okay? One that I love dearly. Um, here's the problem. We have all kinds of tiny towns that are full of tourism, Valdez, Sitka, Ketchikan has a hospital, they can manage a few cases. Juno has a hospital, it can manage a few cases. Valdez, tiny hospital. Cordova, right here by, by, by Valdez, one of the places I work now, tiny hospital. Um, uh, of course, the Kenai Peninsula has some hospitals. They're great. Central Peninsula Hospital is a wonderful facility, but we got six IECU beds. I don't know for sure if they haven't tried to expand that yet. I'm sure we got a handful of ventilators. You know, the bulk of medical care is carried out in Anchorage. There's a couple big hospitals there in the native hospital. I don't know the numbers. I guarantee you it's not. We don't have thousands of ventilators and thousands of ICU beds. And then most of these other areas, got a call today, they're looking for me to come work in Barrow, and that's probably not going to happen. I've got to take care of the communities that I've worked with all these years here and here. Um, King Salmon, not a big hospital there. There's a hospital in Dillingham. I'm sure it can't handle a huge influx. Um, oh, here's a great one. Uh, you know, it's not on the map. Uh, Dutch Harbor's out here. Tiny little town, gets some tourism, and it gets, uh, it has a terrible runway and the worst weather in the world. Now, when these, if, if, if we create clusters at these tiny little places that have very limited resources, and they go widespread like New York, where if you got a runny nose, sore, I mean, you got a, a, a cough, a sore throat, and a fever, you got it. We're done for. All of those places are going to require medevacs to here. This place is going to fill up fast if that happens. Plus, it's probably going to be going on here also if we let this disease come in. Okay? And, and then we're going to be trying to medevac them to Seattle. And how many medevac helicopters and planes do you think we have access to if this is going crazy? All right. So what's my concern? Well, obviously... I'm going to go back to the, to the map, I mean to the outline, so I don't get off course. Tourism. Well, tourism's a huge concern. Tourists, I think motor homes are going to be taken care of by Canada. So we're probably not going to see a huge influx of motor homes until this clearly we know that we're good to go. I hope summer burns it out. I'm not predicting catastrophe. I'm warning for the potential, okay? Now, 
What about people flying in? Well, is there a reli at this point, we don't have a reliable way to make sure they don't have COVID. You know, maybe a month from now, three weeks from now, I can say, gosh, we've got a rapid test. It's so available. We can test everybody before they come in and we can check for antibodies. Be great. I think we're not going to make that in time to salvage at least the early part of our season. I hope I'm wrong. I'd love to see the reopening of New York City. The disease just stays flat. We're good to go. We go, you know what? We did our quarantine here. The rest of the world did. It's dying out. Business as usual. I'm not optimistic. I apologize. So, you know, in the tourism industry, if people came in and I, I can't imagine that the governor's going to lift the quarantine anytime soon. I, I, I don't have any, I don't have his direct ear. Um, I don't think we should until we see what happens in these other places. Um, I think the quarantine's, it's, the quarantine's clearly working here. We barely have any cases. You, you, it's, it's hard to get a positive test. You can see where tourists could come up and sort of stay socially isolated, but what's the point of being here, you know? I mean, they want to go out and go fishing with guides, and I just don't think it's doable until we know we got control of this disease. So I'm get, I guess I'm expressing to you guys that I think we should all be planning on not business as usual for at least the early part of the summer. Commercial fishing industry. This worries me a little bit more. Now, here's, here's my concern. A lot of the canneries, especially in these little towns, Petersburg, Cordova, Valdez, Sitka, um, Dutch Harbor, King Salmon, the canneries are where these people live. Now explain to me how you're going to fly, and mostly are staffed by people from out of state, a lot of them out of the country. How are you going to fly in hundreds and hundreds of workers that live in a communal living setting, okay? Something on the order of like what a cruise ship is with less bathrooms, less hygiene, and bunk style living with multiple people living in the same sleeping quarters. How are you gonna quarantine them? Now I've heard they have a plan, and I don't know if this is true or not. I could get behind it a little bit, it's dangerous, which is you bring them into Anchorage, you actually do a real quarantine, where they are individually housed somewhere in Anchorage where there's probably enough bedding to do it. You got a nurse taking their temperatures, you get them through the 14 day quarantine and then you send them out to those little areas. Okay, fine. But if, though, if that little imitation cruise ship environment gets one case that's asymptomatic and it takes four days for that person to become symptomatic, by the time they realize it, they're eating a galley. The whole place is, they're not all going to get the infection. A high percentage are going to get the infection. And the problem with those places is those people, some of whom are going to get sick, some of them are not the greatest of health, I'm sure. There's probably some cigarette smokers, people with substance abuse issues, metabolic diseases, okay? They're going to get sick. They're going to have to go to these little ERs, see a doc like me who doesn't have much um, resources at his disposal, okay? I don't have everything I need. I don't have a ventilator where I work in one town, okay? Now imagine a barrage of those hitting those little places and they all need to be medevaced to the big centers. Do you see where this is going? And oh, by the way, you're working in the galley and you know, the, 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 you're in this little mini cruise ship environment, but unlike a cruise ship, where you can't just step off the boat into the Pacific Ocean and the government can't stop the cruise ship from getting to where you can infect the rest of the community, you can bolt out of these canneries. So I'm very worried. I'm very worried. And I think reasonably so. And I'm not sure there's a safe plan that can be enacted very soon. And the problem for the commercial fishing industry is in a lot of these places it's early. It's, it needs to start happening now. The cannery workers should be coming in. And I, I just want everybody to think about it. I want the governor to think about, because he's really the one that should make this decision. I don't think the, the mayors of these small communities should have the pressure with both sides of the community chirping at them, the local people who are scared as well, reasonably so, and the fishermen who, and the commercial, in, I mean, in the cannery industry, which is important to these communities, it's the 90% of some of their economic drive 
you know, chirping that we need to get the season open and let's, let's do it, we'll be safe. I got my concerns. Now you know them. That's my Bubba epidemiology. All right, I think I'm done. Was there anything else I wanted to cover? I guess that's it. Look, I'm not trying to make anybody mad. I got my own dog in this fight. I don't endorse that we should have anybody coming into the state unnecessarily. I think people that have homes here, that you know have summer homes, I think they should be allowed in. They can easily 14-day quarantine. I think the commercial aspect of the tourism industry should be restricted until we see what's happening. Italy, Spain, New York, other places where we start to try to restart commerce and see if it comes unwound or not. And I, I, again, I'm not trying to make anybody angry. I'll live with the dislikes. I hope you made it to the end. I think it's really important. Tomorrow, you think you got COVID-19. I'm going to cover the Bubba biology of what I think proper treatment is, what my approach would be if I saw you in the settings where I might see you, what I think you should do based on your symptoms, your risk factors, um, your clinical situation at the time, and uh, what I think appropriate treatment might be. And I'll cover the science as I understand it. I've been digging down on it hard because I have had a lot of free time. Right now, it's not here in Alaska. It's lessened my workload. I don't get to see patients in my primary care clinic because it's not essential. I'm going to do my first telemedicine tomorrow, so we'll see how that goes. Say a prayer for me. God bless. Pray this ends. I hope summer burns it out. We're all in it together. Let's not get greedy over one summer and cause a catastrophe at the statewide level. Bye-bye.